This is the story of how Facebook got banned in China. Part 1. Introduction and Background Facebook is the world's most popular social media site. It launched its Chinese language version in 2008 and was once widely used in China, but since its censorship in mainland China in July 2009, its use has been abandoned by the majority of the Chinese population. Facebook has approximately 2.9 billion monthly active users, nearly 40% of the global population. Yet, only 3 million of those users are Chinese, approximately 4% of China's population. This is a sharp decline, considering that Facebook once claimed to have had 95 million users in China. In this video, we will answer the question, how did the biggest social media site in the world get censored in the biggest consumer market in the world? Before beginning to address the question posed by this video, I should warn you that the full story of how Facebook came to be banned in China contains details of violence that some people might find disturbing. I was in China when Facebook was blocked. It was ubiquitous then, and everybody I met in China with access to a computer had a Facebook account at the time. In 2009, all that would change when race riots broke out in several areas across the country. Uyghur people, native to the far western province of Xinjiang, look different, speak a different language, and have a different religion than most Han Chinese people. The Uyghur's homeland, Xinjiang, wasn't part of China for most of its history, and when it was, it was the result of military conquest. Xinjiang contains over 20% of China's hydrocarbon reserves, despite the native Uyghurs being only 0.4% of China's total population. Oil production alone provides over 60% of the province's budget, though the province's government has been criticized for using its hydrocarbon wealth to benefit Han migrants to the province at the expense of the native Uyghur population. Since few economic opportunities exist for them in Xinjiang, many Uyghurs often leave their home province and become migrant workers, especially to the coastal manufacturing provinces. When I was living in China, Uyghurs were regarded as a sort of ethnic underclass by the Han population at large and had a reputation for being poor, uneducated, and prone to criminality. When researching articles on the incidents mentioned in this video, it was common for Han residents in both Xiaoguan and Xinjiang to remark that Uyghur people had a, quote, low level of civilization. These tensions between Uyghurs and Han Chinese have sometimes boiled over into violence including the series of escalating incidents that happened in 2009 that led to Facebook being banned. Part 2. The Xiaoguan Incident The situation that led to Facebook being banned in China began at a toy factory in Xiaoguan, Guangzhou. There was a general frustration among the workforce of 16,000 people there due to poor dormitory conditions, unpaid overtime, illegal working contracts, and verbal abuse from supervisors. And when the factory began to employ 800 Uyghurs, paid only two-thirds as much as the Han workers and possibly forcibly relocated from Xinjiang, tensions soon arose between the two groups. Problems began at the factory when a disgruntled former worker at the factory spread a lurid conspiracy theory online that spread quickly among the local community. This theory held that two Han women had been raped by six Uyghur men at the factory, According to the rumors, one of the girls later committed suicide, but the authorities had decided not to punish the men and had covered it up instead. Soon, at around midnight on June 26, 2009, about two dozen Han workers began to gather outside the factory dormitory. After using their phones to call for as much backup as they could, the enlarged mob of hundreds of Han men armed with clubs and machetes stormed the dormitory indiscriminately attacking any Uyghurs they found within the building. In the end, the attacks only ended when a force of 400 police arrived on the scene. After the incident, Chinese media claimed that two Uyghurs were killed and 118 people were injured, 79 of which were Uyghur, but online reports circulated that as many as 30 people were killed. One Han man bragged online about killing seven or eight Uyghurs in the incident himself. In earlier times, that would have been the end of the incident, but because China had recently been connected via widespread social media access, the events in Xiaoguan inflamed pre-existing tensions at the other side of the country, in Xinjiang. 
Many photos and videos taken by participants using their phones circulated online, showing mobs of Han people attacking and killing Uyghurs. These photos and videos of Uyghurs killed in the Shaoguan incident were shared widely on social media, along with claims that the police had been deliberately slow to stop the violence. Within days of the Shaoguan incident, Chinese censors had ordered domestic social media websites and discussion boards to delete any mention of the attack. But because this was the early days of widespread internet use in China, the government lacked both the tools and the doctrine to effectively censor the Chinese media and were unable to enact restrictions on foreign social media, such as Facebook. So information and rumors about the event continued to spread. Part 3. The 2009 Xinjiang Unrest In response to the Shaoguan incident, protests and riots occurred across Xinjiang, the most serious of which happened in the provincial capital of Urumqi. On July 5th, Nearly two weeks after the Shaoguan incident, between 1,000 to 10,000 Uyghurs gathered to protest at the Grand Bazaar in Urumqi and began marching towards the center of the city, chanting slogans to protest perceived in action against the murders and beatings of Uyghurs that had happened in Shaoguan. The protests began peacefully but quickly became violent. Exactly what happened to turn the protest into a riot is unclear. The Xinjiang government claimed that the riot was premeditated and orchestrated by foreign-based Uyghur independence organizers, especially the German-based World Uyghur Congress, while Uyghur groups claimed that the protest only became violent after security forces fired indiscriminately into the crowd. The Uyghur American Association alleged that the riots were escalated by agent provocateurs in the crowd. One eyewitness, cited by the New York Times, claimed that violence from security forces began only after protesters began throwing rocks at them. Time magazine reported that violence from protesters occurred only after police attacked the crowd with a baton charge. After their confrontation with the police turned violent, mobs of Uyghur men fanned out throughout the city, smashing cars and other property, ransacking shops, and attacking Han people throughout the city. By the next day, July 6th, Military police had moved into Urumqi and occupied key intersections within the city, though security forces were insufficient to contain the situation and rioting continued in many areas. Chinese President Hu Jintao was in Italy attending a G8 conference when the riots began, but when it became clear that local security forces had lost control of Urumqi and many other areas of Xinjiang, he immediately cancelled his attendance at the event and flew back to China in order to authorize military forces to move into Xinjiang from other areas of China to intervene. The cancellation of Hu's G8 attendance to deal with domestic unrest was reported by the BBC to have been perceived as an embarrassing loss of face. On July 7th, a counter-riot by club-wielding Han residents chanting slogans such as Down with Uyghurs took place, looting Uyghur businesses and attacking Uyghur residents in widespread revenge attacks. By July 8th, most violence in Urumqi had ended, though operations throughout Xinjiang by Chinese security forces to quell unrest continued until the end of July and raids to capture suspected rioters continued in the region until at least another month into mid-August. Internet and wireless services were suspended across Xinjiang within one day of the outbreak of rioting until operations led by Chinese security forces were complete. The riots in Urumqi were the largest and most destructive riots that happened in Xinjiang at the time, but similar riots occurred across many other areas of the province as well, but received little media attention probably due to the lack of foreign reporters in those areas. The most serious riots outside of Urumqi occurred in Kashgar, in which 17 Chinese police were killed. Foreign reporters were evicted from all areas of Xinjiang, especially Kashgar, in order to prevent details of what occurred there from being known. Two days after the riots began, on July 7th, the Chinese government announced that it had arrested 1,434 suspected rioters. Foreign media claimed that the total amount of people arrested in connection to the riot was far higher, totaling approximately 4,000. Exiled Uyghur rights activist Rabia Kadir claimed that the number of Uyghurs who had been disappeared by security forces in the weeks following the riots totaled as much as 10,000, with jails being so over-occupied that detainees had to be housed in warehouses managed by the People's Liberation Army. 
Only about 200 of those detained were formally charged. Very few arrests of Han people for their violent counter-riot on July 7th were reported. The Chinese government claimed that a total of 1,721 people were injured in the riots. It stated that 197 people had been killed, 134 of which were Han. The World Uyghur Congress claimed that official statements had underreported the numbers of Uyghurs killed by security forces during the riots, and estimated that the true number of deaths was around 600. The riots in Xinjiang were the most deadly clash between protesters and the Chinese government since soldiers from the People's Liberation Army killed several hundred protesters in Beijing in 1989. There was some internal political fallout from the unrest in Xinjiang. Many of the top leaders in the province were removed within months after the incident. High-level politicians forced to retire included, but were not limited to, the head of the Communist Party in Xinjiang, Wang Lechuen, the head of the Communist Party in Urumqi, Li Zhe, and Xinjiang's police chief, Liu Yaohua. Internet and even domestic phone services remained restricted in Xinjiang for nearly a year. The Chinese government publicly blamed information spread via email, text and chat messages, and long-distance phone calls, and allocated more resources to monitoring and censoring digital communications across China. Within two days of the unrest in Xinjiang, Chinese state-run media singled out Facebook as the main foreign social media site used by Xinjiang independence activists and claimed that allowing Facebook to continue operating in China violated China's national interests. By July 7, 2009, within two days after the unrest in Xinjiang began, Facebook was censored in China and never completely unblocked. Several years later, in 2014, the Chinese ambassador to the UK, Liu Xiaoming, gave an interview in which he clarified why Facebook was banned. In the interview, Liu stated that China's leadership had determined that Facebook did not follow the law and did not serve the interests of the people. Liu went on to include Facebook of being used to spread rumors and to harm the relationship between Chinese people and people living in the rest of the world. At the time, Liu indicated that the Chinese government was not confident with Facebook's ability to censor Chinese users to the same degree that the Chinese government was able to censor domestic social media platforms, making it impossible for Facebook to re-enter China at that time. Facebook was not the only social media site used by participants to spread rumors and information about the events in Xiaoguan. One other major site used to spread information was the Chinese message board, sg169.com, on which the false rape allegations that led to the Xiaoguan incident were originally posted. Twitter was also blocked in China at the same time as Facebook, and for the same reasons. But, really, who cares about Twitter? Part 4. Conclusion and Analysis It was reported in some American media that Facebook had been blocked partially because it refused to provide protesters' data to Chinese authorities. But, if that is true, Facebook has since come to regret that decision and has taken as many steps as it could to reverse its policies on censorship and state collusion. In 2016, the New York Times reported that Facebook was working on software that would censor the app in preparation for a potential return to China. Several staff members who had been assigned to the censorship project left the company in protest, but there is no indication that this led Facebook's management to change course. In 2017, Facebook agreed to delete 160 user accounts in Vietnam when its censors accused those users of posting content critical of the Vietnamese Communist Party and its leaders, signaling that Facebook was willing to collude with communist governments in the pursuit of state censorship. In 2018, the New York Times reported that Facebook had entered data-sharing partnerships with at least four Chinese electronics companies, basically giving the Chinese government access to its users' data. One of these four companies included Huawei, which is considered by a number of Western nations as being a domestic security risk. Later in 2018, Mark Zuckerberg made a high-level business visit to China, and Facebook invested $30 million in a Hangzhou subsidiary in order to re-establish its foothold on the mainland. But after Zuckerberg left the country, the Chinese government withdrew its permission to run the project, and Facebook's office was forced to shut down without achieving anything of substance. The only progress to come out of Facebook's many efforts to re-enter the Chinese market were, 
In 2018, the Chinese island of Hainan announced that it would allow foreigners access to Facebook in an effort to attract tourists. As of 2022, it seems unlikely that China will ever allow its citizens to access Facebook again on the mainland. Although by the time this video was made, Facebook had fully embraced its role as a purveyor of state propaganda and censorship, even in Western countries, there are so many good domestic social media alternatives to Facebook in China that there isn't necessarily a great demand there for the services that Facebook provides. And if you consider the continued ban on Facebook as a protectionist action to protect the market share of competitors that have a much stronger connection within the Chinese Communist Party than Facebook ever could, the Chinese leadership has a strong motivation to continue the ban. Reportedly, Facebook can still be accessed in mainland China using a VPN, though the last time I was living there, in the mid-2010s, even that was glitchy. If a VPN company were to sponsor me, I'd plug their service right about here. <clears throat>